week of May 25th for Grade 7 ELA. This week, you are asked to read two articles related to marketing and consumerism to find the central ideas. In one article, you will examine how the use of sizing contributes to marketing. The use of sizing plays into what we know about optical illusions and their effect on the brain. For this program, we will look at a few optical illusions and examine an article that discusses the brain's role in interpreting them. Let's first look at some examples of optical illusions. Here is one called the Ebbinghaus illusion. Look at both images and decide which orange circle is larger. Seems like a no-brainer, right? The one on the right appears larger, but actually the circles are the same size. This illusion serves to prove that the surrounding objects affect visual perception. Another illusion that suggests that we perceive size of an object based on its background is the Ponzo illusion. Look at the horizontal lines. Which is longer? If you're catching on, you've probably already guessed that they are the same size. The distortion of the lines in the background cause the brain to perceive the top line as longer. Finally, we have the illusion that is part of your activities this week and is referenced in one of your articles, the Delboeuf illusion. Similar to the Ebbinghaus illusion, this one has us determine which black circle is bigger. The surrounding circles influence the way we see the black dot. Though the one on the right looks bigger, they are, in fact, the same size. This illusion is often used when talking about food portions, as you will see in the article you will read for this week's lessons. Now let's take a look at an article from the Explore magazine and collections that discusses further the effect of optical illusions on the brain. After reading, we will determine the central idea and find some details that support that central idea. More Than Meets the Eye by Kendrick Williams. Wait, what? Can be a typical reaction to an optical illusion. Viewers will try blinking, squinting, rotating the image, and even rotating themselves in order to get just the right vantage point. To varying degrees, optical illusions can mesmerize, intrigue, and confuse, often all at once. That's because most optical illusions are deliberately designed to deceive in some way. Psychologists in the 19th century used patients' reactions to optical illusions to understand the patient's mental disorders. Way back then, the scientific study of the mind was just beginning. Today, 21st century neuroscientists still use optical illusions to investigate how humans perceive what they see. How do optical illusions fool us? There are many theories and few exact explanations. However, some neuroscientists believe that the answers lie in the visual system. The ways in which the eyes and brain work together to process what the eye sees. It's believed that the brain, bombarded with impulses sent by the eye's optic nerve, works hard to make sense of the information it collects about what a viewer sees. When the brain has trouble sorting out gaps in the information, it tries to fill them in to make a more complete and coherent image. Or the brain may have too much information to process and make certain selections. As the result of either circumstance, we might perceive colors, patterns, depths, shapes, sizes, and movements that don't exist. There is a fascinating variety of optical illusions. To experience the tricky features of illusions, begin by taking a close look at the images below. Remember that all the while you are looking at the images, your brain is constantly interpreting information and selecting what to reveal. It's likely that you saw white goblets and vases at first, and then two human faces and figures in profile jumped out, or vice versa. When you focus your attention on the white part of the image, you perceive the dark part as the background because your brain is canceling it out. The reverse effect occurs when you focus on the dark part of the illusion, making the figures and faces stand out. 
Illusions like the one above show how the brain attempts to assess size. Compare the two center dots. Which dot do you think is bigger? If you were to measure them, you'd discover that they're exactly the same size. That's because your brain is using the information of the surrounding dots, either small or large, to make a determination about the size of the center dots. A similar principle is featured in the image above. Identically sized figures in the form of silhouettes look to be progressively larger in size. The silhouettes appear unequal because of their positions on the radiating lines and the diagonal grid pattern. The false impression of distance and depth is the effect of the brain having to process too many varying elements at once. Artists call this forced perspective, a technique of positioning objects to make them appear farther away or larger than they actually are. Contrasting colors can also cause tricky effects. In the image above, staring at the multicolored circles triggers the illusion that they're spinning. As with the goblet illusions, the brain tries focusing on one color while canceling out any others. When focusing on this feature, be aware that you can seem to slow or stop the motion by focusing on the center dot within any of the circles. Look at the images above and pay attention to how your eyes respond to the red and purple flower illusion at the left and the red and yellow illusion at the right. At the left, it may seem that your eyes are being drawn to the purple dot near the center. At the right, your eye might be drawn to the center of the circle. In both illusions, what's probably happening is your brain is perceiving movement as well as a kind of depth within the flat image. Responses to optical illusions can vary from viewer to viewer. If the effect of an illusion doesn't seem to work fast enough for you, or doesn't seem to work at all, that's not at all abnormal. Your unique visual processing system may see things differently. The study of optical illusions in terms of visual perception is ongoing. Neuroscientists are using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, to look at how the brain responds to a range of optical illusions. Whether the curious ones are scientists, artists, or people who simply enjoy illusions as visual brain teasers, these visual puzzles continue to catch the eye. Now that we have read the article, let's go ahead and take a look at what the central idea may be and some supporting details. If I scroll down here to the little quiz that's available to me on this magazine, I see the first question asks me, what is the article's main idea about optical illusions? Illusions are mesmerizing, but don't look at them too long. Illusions are tricks of the eye that don't fool the mind. Illusions happen in cases of vitamin deficiency or illusions are the result of faulty interpretations in the brain. When I think about the information in the article, I realize that a lot of what is given to us is evidence that the brain takes what it perceives and creates meaning out of the image. So that's most closely related to this idea that illusions are the result of faulty interpretations in the brain. If I select this and check myself, I'll see that the quiz tells me that I'm correct. But what I'd like to do is go back to the article and see if I can find some supporting details that really help to prove that that is the central idea. So as I scroll back to the top, I'm going to skim through and I'm going to look for anywhere where it discusses how the brain is affected by the optical illusion and what the brain does to process that illusion. The first time I notice that there's evidence of that is in the third paragraph here, where it says, some neuroscientists believe that the answers lie in the visual system, the ways in which the eyes and brain work together to process what the eye sees. 
That's my first piece of evidence that optical illusions have something to do with how the brain is working to perceive the image. As I scroll down a little more, I see some further explanation. It says when the brain has trouble sorting out gaps in the information, it tries to fill them in to make a more complete and coherent message, image. Or the brain may have too much information to process and make certain selections. So this is further explanation of what is happening in the brain as it is uh, processing those optical illusions, which continues to prove that central idea that optical illusions are all about um, the faulty processing happening within the brain. As I continue to scroll down, I see some examples of optical illusions, and I remember that in the explanations of those examples, they discuss exactly what happens in the brain as it's processing those illusions. So here for this first one with the goblets, I see it says, when you focus your attention on the white part of the image, you perceive the dark part as the background because your brain is canceling it out. The reverse effect occurs when you focus on the dark part of the illusion, making the figures and faces stand out. So this is explaining to me that the reason that I might either see faces first or goblets first is because my brain is deciding which part I want to focus on and which part I'm going to cancel out. On the next image, we see that it talks about how the brain is using the information of the surrounding dots, either small or large, to make a determination about the size of the center dots. So again, talking about the reason I'm seeing what I'm seeing is because of some faulty processing happening within the brain. Down here under this image, it explains that the false impression of distance and depth is the effect of the brain having to process too many varying elements at once. Artists call this forced perspective. Again, the brain, processing the information, filling in gaps, making decisions. If we look at the uh, image with the colors, we see that it talks about how the brain tries to focus on one color while canceling the others out, just like with the goblet illusion. So this is sort of reinforcing evidence here. And down here, it says what's probably happening as we look at these two images is the brain is perceiving movement as well as the kind of depth with the flat image. So anytime that they're talking to us about what's happening with the brain and what the brain is processing, I want to highlight that as some supporting evidence to the central idea that optical illusions are all about the faulty processing that is happening within the brain. Let's review. We determined that the central idea was illusions are a result of faulty interpretations in the brain. Some of the supporting details from the article were the ones that referred to the effects of the optical illusions on the brain. Now it's your turn. Read the two articles assigned to you this week. For the first article, Labels and Illusions, you are focusing on two central ideas one related to labels in food marketing, and one related to labels in clothing. You will highlight the evidence that supports each of those central ideas. For fair warning, you will identify the sentence in the article that actually states the central idea. Then you will examine cause and effect relationships discussed in the article to support that central idea. Good luck and happy reading. Hi there, and welcome to the week of May 25th. Uh, ELA 7GT Lesson 2. For this lesson, we will be looking at sentence types and structure, as well as combining sentences to improve writing. For this segment, we will focus on four main sentence types, simple, compound, complex, and compound complex. Let's start with simple sentence. A simple sentence is also called an independent clause. It contains a subject and a verb, and it expresses a complete thought. If we look at this example, she likes bananas, we can see that we have a subject, she, 
and a verb likes. So this has one subject for a pair and expresses one complete thought. In the second sentence, we have a little bit uh, of longer sentence with more words, but we still only have one subject for a pair. The man with the yellow hat gave Curious George a present. Our subject being the man and our verb being gave. All of the additional words are just descriptors to add to those ideas. So again, one subject for a pair, one independent clause, simple sentence. Here's another one that's a little bit longer, but is still just a simple sentence. George Orwell uses allegory to make a statement about communist Russia in his novella, Animal Farm. The subject being George Orwell, the verb being uses. Everything else is just additional descriptors to support those that one subject verb pair. Let's take a look at compound sentences. A compound sentence contains two independent clauses joined by a coordinator. That coordinator could be a coordinating conjunction, a semicolon, or a semicolon plus conjunctive adverb plus comma. More often than not, you'll probably see coordinating conjunctions being used to create compound sentences. So let's just take a quick look at what those are. We call our coordinating conjunctions fanboys. And that stands for for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. So if you see these words in a sentence, you can take a look at what their function in the sentence might be. If they're functioning to connect two clauses, they're acting as a coordinating conjunction in a compound sentence. Here's an example. She likes bananas, but he likes apples. We can see that word but being used to connect those two clauses together. And here we have two subject verb pairs indicating that we have two clauses. In the next sentence, the man with the yellow hat gave Curious George a present. George loved it. In this case, we still have two subject verb pairs, so two independent clauses, and we're using that semicolon to connect those two ideas. We know these clauses are independent because each of them can stand on their own. I can say, the man with the yellow hat gave Curious George a present, and I could say, George loved it, and each of those makes sense by themselves. In the final example, George Orwell used allegory to make a statement about communist Russia in his novella, Animal Farm. However, the themes could be applied to other social structures. So we have George Orwell used, and then the themes could be applied, and we've connected those two independent clauses with a semicolon, the conjunctive adverb, however, and a comma. Now let's move on to complex sentences. A complex sentence has an independent clause joined by one or more dependent clauses. Something that can be helpful in identifying dependent clauses is looking for some of those keywords that can begin dependent clauses. Subordinating conjunctions are something that you could find at, a deep, at the beginning of a dependent clause. We identify subordinating conjunctions by using the acronym AWUBIS. What AWUBIS stands for is after, although, as, when, while, until, before, because, if, since. So if you're looking for a sentence type and you're trying to figure out whether it is complex, you could try to find these words and then take a look at their function in the sentence. You might also see at the beginning of a dependent clause a relative pronoun, that, which, or who. If you, if you find these in the sentence, then what they will be doing is serving as the subject of that dependent clause. You might also see words like that or which acting as conjunctions at the beginning of a dependent clause. Let's take a look at some examples and see how they might be used and how we can identify those dependent clauses within a complex sentence. Since she likes bananas, he made banana pudding. First thing I want to do is find my subject verb pairs. I find she likes and he made. So now I'm going to look at the words associated with those subject verb pairs. Since she likes bananas, I notice that I have the word since, which is one of my awabas subordinating conjunctions. I also know that if somebody walked up to me and said, since she likes bananas, I'd be waiting for some more information. So that means this is not a complete thought. This would be a dependent clause. If I look at my second subject verb pair, he made, I see that it's connected with banana pudding. If someone walked up to me and said, he made banana pudding, I'd say, great, that sounds delicious. I'd like to have some. 
It's a complete thought. I understood exactly what they were trying to tell me right away. Let's look at the next sentence. The man with the yellow hat gave Curious George a present, which made George so happy. In this case, our first clause has the subject, the man, and the verb, the gave. And in our second clause, we have a relative pronoun that is acting as the subject with the verb made. So I can see here that the first part of the sentence is an independent clause. The man with the yellow hat gave Curious George a present. The second part of the sentence is a dependent clause, which made George so happy. And the last sentence, George Orwell used allegory in his novella Animal Farm because he wanted to make a statement about communist Russia. I see my subject in the first clause, George Orwell, and my verb used. In the second clause, he wanted. And then I see one of those subordinating conjunctions there beginning that second clause. So I know that my second clause is because he wanted to make a statement about communist Russia, which is a dependent clause. So what happens if your sentence has two independent clauses and one or more dependent clauses? Well, then you have something really special called a compound complex sentence. In a compound complex sentence, you have two or more independent clauses, so basically a compound sentence, and then you tack on one or more dependent clauses, which makes it complex. Here's an example. George Orwell's Animal Farm is a novella that makes a statement about communist Russia. However, the themes could be applied to other social structures. So in this case, I should have at least three subject verb pairs. Animal Farm is, that makes, and the themes could be applied. So since I have three subject verb pairs, I know that I have three clauses. Let's take a look at the words within those clauses and figure out if they're independent or dependent. George Orwell's Animal Farm is a novella. That is an independent clause. It makes sense on its own. That makes a statement about communist Russia. That is a dependent clause. However, the themes could be applied to other social structures. So that's an independent clause because I've tacked that however in the beginning as a connector. So I'm going to kind of ignore that as I look at the subject verb pairs within that part of the sentence. And I see that the themes could be applied to other social structures. That is a complete or independent thought. So here are some tips for identifying sentence types. The very first thing you want to do is find your subject verb pairs. The number of subject verb pairs that you have in the sentence will equal the number of clauses, and that will make it easier for you to identify which sentence type you're working with. Once you've found those subject verb pairs, you can start looking for things like coordinating conjunctions, subordinating conjunctions, conjunctive adverbs, and relative pronouns. They might give you a hint as to what kinds of clauses you'll have in the sentence. Keep in mind, though, that there are words that can play double or even triple duty. So if a word is a coordinating conjunction in one sentence, it might function as a preposition in another sentence. So it's important that after you found the word to really think about what its function in the sentence is to identify whether it's going to help you identify that sentence type. And then finally, once you've found your subject verb pairs, you want to group those ideas together and then determine whether that group of ideas is an independent clause or a dependent clause. Or in other words, does it make sense by itself or does it need the other part of the sentence in order to make sense? So let's do a little practice. We're going to take a look at three sentences from the Molly's story assignment in this week's lesson. And we're going to follow those steps to see if we can identify the sentence type of each sentence. So in the first sentence, my life was pretty great living with Mr. Jones. First thing I want to do is identify those subject verb pairs. So when I do that, I find that I have my life and was. As I look through the rest of the sentence, I do not see any additional verbs. So therefore, I have only one subject verb pair. So since I have only one subject verb pair, I have just one independent clause which means I have a simple sentence. For the second one, my hair was braided. Again, I'm going to identify subject verb pairs. So I've got my hair and was braided. There are no other words in the sentence, so therefore I know I have just one subject verb pair, therefore one clause and a simple sentence. 
In the last sentence, Mr. Jones also made sure that I had sugar every day. I see that now I have more than one subject verb pair. I had Mr. Jones made and I had. I'm also noticing that the word that is here in the sentence. Even though that is not a relative pronoun in this case, it is serving as a conjunction in between these two ideas and beginning that second clause. So in this case, I have Mr. Jones made sure and then that I had sugar every day. So the that at the beginning of this clause is showing me that we have a dependent clause. So we have an independent clause and a dependent clause, which makes my sentence complex. So now that we've talked about identifying sentence types, let's talk about combining sentences. We combine our sentences to make our writing more interesting to read and make us better able to emphasize some different ideas within our writing. In order to combine sentences, it's a good idea to look for related ideas in order to make a simple sentence, either compound complex or compound complex. You could also borrow descriptive words from a simple sentence and add them to another sentence. Or maybe you could take a simple sentence and turn it into a phrase to combine with another sentence. Let's do a little practicing with combining sentences. We're going to take a look at the first paragraph of Molly's story from this week's lesson. Think about what you notice about the sentence structure. My life was pretty great living with Mr. Jones. I had my hair brushed. My hair was braided. I also had bows put in my hair all of the time. I felt extremely pampered. Mr. Jones also made sure that I had sugar every day. Now, consider some ways that you could revise this paragraph to make it flow better. Grab a pencil and some paper and jot down your ideas. If you're able to, this would be a good time to pause the program to give yourself time to get your ideas written down before we show you some examples of responses that you could have created. Here are some ways that you could have adjusted those sentences to make them flow a little bit better. My life was pretty great living with Mr. Jones. I always had my hair brushed and braided with beautiful bows. I felt extremely pampered. Mr. Jones also made sure that I had sugar every day. Notice that we took a couple of those simple sentences in the middle of the paragraph and just borrowed some words from them to create a longer simple sentence. In the second option, my life was pretty great living with Mr. Jones. I felt extremely pampered because my hair was brushed, braided, and decorated with bows all of the time. Mr. Jones also made sure that I had sugar every day. In this case, we moved that I felt extremely pampered sentence a little earlier in the paragraph, and then we also combined those several simple sentences in the middle to create a complex sentence. You may have chosen to do something a little bit different. Maybe your sentences look different from what is up here, and that's totally fine. As long as what you've done has taken what was there, made it flow a little bit better, and stayed true to the ideas that were already there within the paragraph, then you've done a great job. So now it's your turn again. For your lesson this week, you have been asked to label the types of sentences that Molly uses as simple, compound, complex, or compound complex. You'll then go and put stars next to the simple sentences that could be combined or expanded to increase the sentence variety. Think about what we just did with that previous activity. You'll then pick five sentences from Molly's story that you could improve by combining them with other sentences and or expanding upon them. So when you are completing this task, think about how you might be able to take those simple sentences and create compound or complex or compound complex sentences from them, or maybe you'll keep them as simple sentences with some additional descriptors. Either way, try to make sure you're staying true to what was already written and your task is really just to manipulate the sentences so that they flow a little bit better. Good luck and happy sentence editing.